Very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for taking your afternoon to be with us today for our third session of the Research Edge uh, presentation for this semester. Today, we have two more interesting presentation. The first presentation, a presentation uh, entitled A Model for Sustainable Economic Growth in the Bahamas. This will be presented by uh, Dr. Tri D. Lam, an Associate Professor of Economics uh, from the Business and Hospitality Management uh, Unit of the University of the Bahamas. The second presentation from Dr. Williamson Gustav, uh, Assistant Professor of Biology, Chemistry, Environment, and Life Sciences of UB. He'll be talking about the effects of climate change on rice grain quality and yield, the role of soil microbes. Um, so please be informed, this session is recorded. All your mic uh, have been muted currently. So if you do have a question uh, as the presenter is presenting, you can continuously put it in the chat. We will address all the question uh, at the end of each of the presentation. Um, and if you want to ask question directly to the presenter, you just need to raise your uh, electronic hands and I will unmute you uh, for the questions and the presenter can respond to you uh, at the end of his uh, presentation. All right, so without further ado, uh, let me invite our first uh, presenter today, Dr. Tridi Lam, uh, to present uh, his uh, research and uh, allow, I'm going to allow him to share his screen now. Okay. Will you see now? Yes, yes. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Can you put it on full screen, slideshow. You hear me now? No, can you put the slide on a slideshow? All I right, mean? okay, yes. Okay, thank you. All right, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> it's uh, five o'clock uh, Saturday morning in Australia, so good morning to me. It's about 10 days ago, so I received an email from Dean Bignair inviting me to present a paper on research ads. I could not say no to him, so I had 10 days to prepare for this presentation while teaching five courses. I actually just uh, fully finished everything a couple of hours ago. So it means that I spent a sleepless night last night. And now I'm given 20 minutes for this presentation. Why? I have uh, 20 um, slides. So one slide per minute on average. <clears throat> In the Bahamas, tourism, sorry. <clears throat> in the Bahamas, tourism is the number one industry. The economy is solely dependent on tourism as one of the sources to generate economic growth alone, contributing an estimated 60% of the gross domestic products. Also, employing approximately half of the Bahamian workforce. So according to Tourism Today, no date. The uh, Bahamian's economies have relied mainly on the continuous slow and unstable growth of this industry. Why I dare to say so? Here, look at it, charts. This industry progress has been stunted over the last two decades. If we compare it with other countries, big progress in the region, such as Cuba, Jamaica, Dominican Republic, et cetera, right? So now we look at the charts. Our country is blue line here, right? 
almost a flat line at the bottom. Jamaica is the yellow line, orange is Cuba, and the gray line is Dominican Republic. So these charts show the two decades of tourist arrival for the four country from 2000 to 2019, start in 2000 and then 2010, and from 2016 to 2019 continuously. Now, let's compare the number of tourist arrival in 2019 only between our country, the Bahamas, and those three countries in the regions. So we have 49% fewer visitors than Jamaica, 160% less than Cuba. In uh, 2018, because Cuban data for 2019 is not available, and 258% less than the Dominican Republic in the same year of 2019. Why? Why they attracted huge more visitors than ours? These data is uh, uh, in the charts retrieved from the UN World Tourism Organizations based on inbound tourism arrival, overnight visitor. <coughs> now, let's move on to the next slide. We need to detail our 10 years progress from 2011 to 2020 for visitor arrival and data collected from our central bank's quarterly statistical digest just published last month in February 2011, 2021, volume 30 and number one. The blue line, <coughs> The blue line represents visitor arrival by air, the orange line for visitor arrival by sea, and the gray line for air and sea total arrival. So we see that the blue line is more fluctuated with ups and downs than the orange line. Well, visitor come by air as more important than by sea and they stay overnight from a couple of days to a couple of weeks. So they're spending more money for our goods and services, right? And we see there, the red numbers are the average progress for the 10 years. During last year pandemic, the progress from the prior year 2019 to <clears throat> 2020, was negative 75%. If including the pandemic effect, the average progress is negative at 5.34% and 3.39% if excluding last year pandemic effect. So obviously we see that the number of tourists arrival by air in the last 10 years is very unstable is volatile with a small average growth rate. All right, so why have those country in the region attracted two to five times more than, more tourists than our country? Is it because their sun is warmer? Because their sea water is cleaner or more crystal? or because their sand is whiter, or their people are nicer, or their resort are more beautiful than ours. And the question is how to push the number of our visitors up two to three times in the next 10 years. However, this is not within the scope of this study and the answers will be in my next presentation. Now we move to the research objective. A country's sustainable economic growth cannot rely on such a single volatile tourism industry. We depends primarily on other country financial situation, 
especially during a global pandemic like COVID-19, when all countries' borders are closed. Therefore, this study will find a method to determine some potentially untapped industry which can contribute significantly to the Bahamian economy in the long run. Now we move to theoretical framework. According to Ricardo comparative advantage theories, it makes sense for a country to specialize in producing those goods that is produced most efficiently and to buy the goods that is produced less efficiently from other countries, even if it could make them more efficiently itself. Well, Adam Smith explained the gain from trade based on increasing returns to scale. Ricardo has demonstrated that the gain from trade can arise even in the absence of increasing return to scale if the relative cost of productions differ between countries. <clears throat> Sheehan et al. 1994 state that comparative advantage is a central concept in conventional neoclassical international trade theory and refer to the abilities of a country to produce the commodities at a relatively low price based on factor endowments and prices prevailing a pre-trade situation. This differential ability arising from relative differences in resort endowments, preferences, and tastes. Thus, comparative advantage is defined not only in terms of the assumption of pure competition, but also in pre-trade relative prices. An important task facing applied economists has been to identify comparative advantages from observations of real world trading outcomes, which embodies both post-trade comparable prices and the range of distortion characteristic of actual market. <clears throat> I have to say that I am proud every time I mention my mentor, my PhD supervisor, and also my former director, Professor Peter Sheehan. This is his statement. Professor Sheehan is ill to be a general director of Victoria Treasury Department in Australia. He was also a special economic advisor to the Australian Prime Minister Bob Hawke in the 1980s. He resigned from the Treasury Department to establish the Center for Strategic Economic Study, where I received the PhD scholarship from him. And this center later it changed its name to Victoria Institute of Strategic Economic Study. And he is now more than 80 years old, but still working in, in research. Okay, so now we move to the met methodology. In 1965, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Balasa introduced what he called the Index of Review Comparative Advantage, which listeners first view in 1958. This study is in mirror data statistic from the United Nations contract database for the latest available periods of 2012 to 2016. And Balasa reviewed comparative advantage index methods to identify other potentially untapped industry in the Bahama. <coughs> okay. This index has become well known and probably used by many researchers to identify a country's competitiveness in specific industry or products concerning international trade. Review comparative advantage measures it can be employed to analyze the changing patterns of comparative advantage across commodities 
due to a process of accumulation of physical and human capital that's characterized economic development. <coughs> this index is a country's share in the world exports of a given commodity or industry relative to that country overall share in total work exports. It looks complicated and confusing. Now, let me explain by giving an example for easy understanding. Now, let's assume that we export salt, right? And there is a fraction in the numerator as well as the denominator. On top of the numerator fractions is the total values of our salt export divided by the total value of the exports of the world's export of salt. And in the denominator, on top is our country total export values divided by the world's total export value. A country, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a country, for instance, the Bahamas is said to have a comparative advantage in producing and exporting a product, say that, okay, salt, to any reference country, say Cuba. If its review comparative advantage value is greater than unity, since the portion of the Bahamas sold or any kinds of product or industry penetrates and is consumed more than that of Cuba in the world market. In other words, if the estimated Review comparative advantage is greater than unity. The suggestion is that Bahamas export are reaching closer to, to the pattern of the world's export at a relatively fast pace. Conversely, if its RCA value is less than unity, that means between zero and one, and this product or industry is said to have a comparative disadvantage. For example, if an index of a given product is 1.5, would this mean that the export share of this product or industry is 50% higher than the share of work exports of the same products or industry? So this infers that the Bahama has an advantage over the rest of the world by approximately 50%. In contrast, an index of one is indicate that the Bahamas have neither comparative advantage nor disadvantage relative to the rest of the world in producing and exporting that particular products. Okay, now we move to the result from the analysis. So this is the main findings. I have two separate table of findings. This table give details for the last year, 2016, right? Because it's only available from 2016. And this is collected from the United, United, uh, Track, uh, Comtrack, United Nations Comtrack database. So the first column, the first column here is the industry. The second column is the export in value, it's unique in thousand. The third column is export as a share of total exports. The fourth column is export as a share of work exports. The fifth column is number of export products. And the sixth is number of export markets. The seventh column is the net trade, so which means that the difference between export and imports. And the last column is the value of Palasas review comparative advantage calculated based on the formula mentioned above. Please note that I remove all other positive but small RCA index 
and low values of export for less than a couple of million dollars. The results in this table combining high RCI index and positive net trade. So which means that you see the trade surplus. There are four sectors in this table ones, which are hex x 3 sector here. It's contained, hex 3 sector contain fish, crustaceans, mollusks, aquatic invertebrates, not as well specified. The next one is hex 25 sector. This includes salt, sulfur, earth, stone, plaster, lime, and cement. And the next one is XS29 sector comprised of organic chemical. And the last one, XS39 sector is covered plastic and article, that's off. And there are two sector in main findings of table two. Has S27 sector is include minerals, fuels, oils, distillations, product, etc. And has S89 sector is contains ships, poles, and other floating structure. However, these two sector in table two in the main fighting two are import for export. So we buy in order to sell. So they are not domestically produced and their net trades always negative, which means that trades deficit. We bought new ship, new boats or new, and then we sold the secondhand ones. So they should not consider as comparative advantage industry. Therefore, I delete this table too. I move it out. Now, we go into detail each of the sector in findings of table one. Please note that the values here are the net trades. So the export values are higher than that, right? So in hex s 3 sector, I identify one important industry with a hex s 306 being crustaceans. It's held very high. It's at <clears throat> very high review comparative advantage index with high value of net trade for the five years period. So the rest number here is a comparative advantage index. And this is the values of net trade. For example, in 2016, the net trade is 76 million, 689,000 per Hayman dollar. <clears throat> okay, now with um, in hex x twenty five sector, also there is only one industry with the hex x twenty one zero twenty five zero one is being sold with very high RCA. <clears throat> we move to hex S29 sector. The industry has a 2933. 30, uh, 2933. This is heterocyclic compounds with nitrogen, heteroatom, nucleic acids. It has a huge potential to contribute to GDP, right? So again, the red number here is the RCI index. And this is the value of net trade in these five years periods. Okay, now the last one has a 39 sector. The industry is XS3903.
polymers of styrenes in primary form. She also very important with Hughes nitrate over that five years period. We see here the um, RCA index, and this is the value, the net track, right? So the export value, value must be higher than that. 155 million, 184 million, 171 million, right? Oh, this contributes significantly to the GDP. Okay, now, conclusion and recommendations. The following industry groups combining high review comparative entities index and last positive net trace values are considered great potential industry, which should have the government support with practical strategy and policy to become solid comparative entity industry. In this way, together with the tourism industry, they will contribute significantly to behavior gross domestic products and thus produce sustainable economic growth for the Bahamas in the long run. Okay, so this is all the sector. Sector three, we got uh, protestants, mollus. Sector 25, we got salt, uh, pepper, gravel, broken, crust, stone, macadam, or slag, or dross, and sector 29, and sector 39. So this is the end of the my presentation. And thank you for your time attending my presentations. Uh, any question, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank Dr. Lam, for your uh, quite detailed presentation and your uh, on your findings here. So let me now open the floor for questions. So I see there's a few questions here. Uh, first question, has your study identified any specific limitations? <clears throat> a limitation is, uh, as I say, that so the data collected from the uh, United Nations contract database this is available for this five years. It's, no, it's not after um, uh, 2016, so from 2012 to 2016. Okay. And yes, that's it. Is, is there is any there, other question? Is there any shortcomings of this model that you have presented today? Okay, um, this is a good question. Is it possible there's actual track patterns on which the, uh, the RCA index calculations are based may not reflect true comparative advantages? The, uh, the divergence between the RCAs and true comparative advantages result is primarily from market distortions. It's caused by gov government intervention since the actual trade data is ill to calculate index of RCA. The problems arise that the results may reflect not only natural forces of comparative advantage, but also affect the effects of market distortion. And these market distortions is includes tariffs, quotas, export incentive, extraordinary high transport costs, or um, embargoes, or labor market distortion, and many other government distortion activity. Um, right. In fact, the most of the uh, RCA's studies are limited to processed goods and manufactured items because the presence of governments in the trace of agricultural products is often strong. So all this is point to the fact that the, re the real comparative advantages of products might be distorted so much that the RCA approach may be misleading and may of obscure real pattern of comparative advantages. Yes. Yeah. So that's so, uh, the uh, drawbacks of the, this uh, model. 
but yes. this is still widely used by researchers when they, they try to calculate the uh, comparative advantages or the competitiveness of its uh, products uh, with the other countries. I, I see the fur there's further comment from uh, Dr. Saunders on uh, barriers to trade are not accounted for in the model. Sorry, well, can you say again? Barriers to trade are not accounted for in the model. Why not? Why not? They both high tariff. What's about both high tariff? The price is different, right? And also in my mentor, Professor Sheehan, he mentioned that before, it should be pre-trade value because after trade value, it may be affected by, by the government uh, policy is distorting the price, right? They put high tariffs, so the price is uh, getting very high or they, they got the quota, so that means also the price will go up because the quota is uh, in, it stop the, the, the goods coming into the country. Yeah. I see we have a lot of questions uh, coming in, Dr. Lam. Uh, so let's uh, try to answer as much before we call the next presentation. Um, have you used any stats from the Caribbean Tourism Organization? No, no. In this one, no. I mentioned that is it from the World Tourism Organization. Okay. Can the RCA index for the tourism industry as a whole be calculated like the others? Yes. Okay. Yes. Your slide on methodology introduced by Balasa Data Statistics could you explain a little further on mirror data statistics? Okay, mirror, oh, this is a good question. It's, uh, you need to clarify what's in mirror statistic. For country that do not report track data, right? For example, Bahama didn't report the track data to the United Nations. So the United Nations will use partner country data and approach is referred to as mirror statistic, which are the second best solutions. It's better than having no data at all. Yes, of course. So this method has several, but this method also, the mirror statistic also has several shortcomings when compared to the first best solutions of nationally reported data. First, they do not cover track with other non-reporting country. As a result, the mirror statistic hardly covers South-South trade. South-South trade, that means trade between the developing country. And second, there is a problem of trans shipments which may hide the actual source of supply. And thus, mirror statistics are usually 10% higher than higher for importing country and because they use the CAF term. It's including cost and insurance. It's, it's covering the, the transport and, and insurance, right? And in contrast, the exporting country, they use FOB term, it's free on board. So that's why the importing country, the mirror city, the value, the, the value that we see always often is it 10% higher because it including the cost of the transportation and the insurance costs. Would you advocate the diversification of the Bahamian economy? How should this take place? Uh, well, actually that I don't, I don't pay much attention on, on this one, right? teaching five courses, so well, you invite me to make uh, show the presentation. That's why in the last 10 days, I spent a lot of time working on this one. Well, I, at least I have a, I have a, a pay attention and have got time to have a look in the total, uh, I mean, there's all the data related to the Bahama and then I will have a, a, a conclusion on that. But also in my presentation, I mentioned why the other country in the region, they have more huge tourists coming visit their country. But we us on the bottom line, why? And I have the result for that, right? I have the answer for that. So well, I hope that's so in the next presentation. And also 
I got the, I can, I can prove that we can do something in order to boost the number of visas coming into Bahama two to three times more than the current level, the current volumes of uh, tourism arrival into the country in the next 10 years. I can, I promise that. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lam. I know there's, there's more question in the chat, but it, due to the uh, time constraint, uh, I'm not able to address all, but rest assured, uh, I will take all your questions in the chat and I will send it to Dr. Lam so that he's able to respond to it and, and give you the response that you want uh, for it. So, so for the moment, uh, sorry that I'm not able to pull all the questions because we have to move on uh, to the next uh, presentation. So thank you so much, Dr. Lam. I know you're so busy and uh, you've taken your trouble uh, with, the, with, the, with the time difference that uh, you are still able to, uh, to accept my invite to, to present today. So thank you so much for that. All right, so I thank you very much for everyone to attend in my presentation. Thanks. Okay, so moving on, uh, we go to our next uh, presentation uh, from Dr. Williamson Gustave. So this is going to be another uh, interesting presentation today. So I'm going to uh, hand over the session to, to, uh, to, to, Gost to Dr. Gustave. Uh, you can share your screen. Okay, we see you. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Vic, for inviting me to give this presentation. And today I'm going to talk on the effect of climate change on rice grain quality and rice grain yield. And I'm going to focus heavily on the roles of soil microbes as I am a microbial ecologist and biogeochemist. So I find it very important to start my presentation today with this picture here. And the reason why I think this is very important is because most of us, especially us who spend most or uh, all of our life in the Bahamas, have no idea how a rice paddy soil look or even how a rice plant look. For myself, I did not um, see a rice plant or even a rice paddy soil until I traveled to Asia. So this diagram here shows you a rice paddy soil. And as you can see, the rice paddy soil is uh, just like any typical field, but this field is flooded. And today my whole research, is my whole talk is going to focus on this paddy soil and how that affects the rice that's growing on it and how it affects the rice quality. So my next question or the next item that I want to explain is why rice is so important and why paddy soils are so important. The first thing, paddy soils are the largest man-made wetlands on earth. So a lot of freshwater bodies out there are present, but they are too deep. So if you wanna grow rice, you're going to have to make these paddy soils by yourself. So this means you're going to use water and most of the time we will choose to use wastewater to flood the, 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 cropping, the cropping farms and to produce the conditions that are required for cropping rice. Another reason why they are extremely important is because they grow rice. Rice is extremely important because rice feed 4 billion people, 56% of the world population. In fact, it is the main staple crop for 6 million people. In the Bahamas, we eat so much rice. If you look at the bottom right of my screen, you'll see, you know, we eat so much rice and Recent research have shown that we eat as much or even more rice than what Asian countries' uh, um, citizens consume. Rice, like Dr. Lam explained earlier about money, I don't know much about economics, but I do know that rice account for 13% of the world crop value and produce or farmers make about 206 billion US dollars each year. But rice and party field is not always all that good. So paddy field has some downfall. And one of the major downfalls is that paddy field is one of the main source of methane. And as we know, methane is a greenhouse gas and that will definitely increase the earth climate and the earth temperature. And that's not a good thing, especially for us, an island nation. Secondly, 
most of the arsenic, so arsenic is a toxic trace metal that we come in contact with is from rice. So from eating rice, we come, we accumulate most of the arsenic that we face, uh, we, that we have in our bodies today. And why is this so? This is so because most of the soils today that we use to grow rice in, most of these paddy soils are extremely contaminated. Some are naturally contaminated, and these naturally contaminated soils are found in Asia, especially in Bangladesh and India. But for the most part, this contamination is caused by us. We put this metal in the soil. And these metals enter the soil through one, either from fertilization, from adding fertilizers. In the past, we didn't know arsenic to be so, uh, um, we didn't know the toxicity effect of arsenic. So we added arsenic in our fertilizer because it can also stimulate growth. Um, a lot of the arsenic gets in the soil from the irrigation water. So like I said earlier, paddy fields are ma largely man-made and you don't wanna use fresh drinking water to flood the soil. So we will choose to use irrigation water. And that sometimes, and this irrigation water sometimes contain uh, arsenic and other heavy metals that enters the soil. And a lot of the arsenic that's in the soil today comes from pesticides, especially in countries where um, cotton were grown. So the pesticide that was used to control the, spill, the, the chilling bug in the cotton field contained arsenic. And when these, when slavery ended and the cotton trade um, loses its popularity, a lot of these fields were then converted into rice paddy field. So rice is going to accumulate arsenic and it's going to store this arsenic in the greens and that itself is very problematic to us and I'm going to try to explain this as we go throughout this presentation. So we can't understand um, the problem with arsenic and how it links to rice and food security and food safety without first going through a little bit of biogeochemistry. So under normal condition, even though the soils are contaminated, the arsenic will not be bioavailable for the plant. This simply means that the plant will not be able to take up this arsenic and this arsenic will remain in the soil and not be a problem for us. However, when we grow rice, rice requires some period where it needs to be flooded. And when you flood this rice, the bacteria that's growing in the soil that once choose to use oxygen because it gained more energy from using oxygen will no longer have oxygen available to it. So this bacteria will now choose to breed mineral oxides. And when this oxygen is depleted due to flooding, this bacteria will breed mineral oxides and many of the toxic trace elements that are in the soil that were once trapped on the surface of these mineral oxide will now be released and become bioavailable for these plants. And then the rice plant will uptake this metal and store it in its green. So when we now eat the rice grain or any other edible part of that plant, we will become exposed to this arsenic and this will be problematic to us. So like every family, not everybody is going to be equally as bad. So in the arsenic family, they have different toxicity. So arsenic in the soil can be described in general as total arsenic, but total arsenic is made of two parts. The first part is organic arsenic and the second part is inorganic arsenic. Organic arsenic is, you know, in quotation marks safe. We say it is safe, because our body can process the organic arsenic and we can definitely get rid of it and it won't remain in us long enough to cause cancer or any other organ failure that is associated with arsenic. And I put safe in quotation mark because MMA, which stands for monometal arsenoic acid and DMA, which stands for dimethyl arsenic acid, which are two forms of organic arsenic Although they are not toxic to us, they are very toxic to plant, especially the rice plant. It's going to cause many disease in the rice plant. The inorganic arsenic on the other hand are toxic to us and are toxic to the soil microbes and to the plant. So the, there are two main types of organic, inorganic arsenic 
And these two main types of inorganic arsenic are arsenic-3, which is arsenite, and arsenic-5, which is arsenate. Arsenic-3, even though both arsenic-3 and arsenic-5 are toxic, arsenic-3 is far more toxic than arsenic-5. And the reason for that is because arsenic-3 do not you know, keep, like to keep company. So it will not precipitate with mineral oxides. It will always remain bioavailable for the plant and the plant will accumulate it. Arsenic-5 on the other hand, even though it is toxic, it is very likely to precipitate with mineral oxide. So it will not be available for the plant. Therefore, the plants will not be able to take it. I should mention that in soil systems, the organic forms of arsenic are found in much lower concentration as compared to the inorganic forms which dominate the species of arsenic in the soil. So what does have to do with global warming? Why I chose to combine those two terms, you know, talk about global warming, food security, and food quality in one presentation. Well, we already know from the from recent studies that the earth, and not only from studies, you can feel it, that the earth temperature is increasing. In fact, the, I, the IPCC has predicted by the end of this century, by the end of uh, you know, this century, by 2100, the earth climate will increase by, will increase to four degrees, by four, by four degrees Celsius. So this is not good. It is not good because one, high temperature has detrimental effect to crop and it will also have detrimental effect to the crop yield and crop qu quality, especially rice. And I'll explain this in more detail. So the first thing is that if the temperatures continue to increase as they are increasing now, we will suffer a lot of crop loss. We will suffer a lot of crop loss because this heat will add stress to the plant and many of the plant will die. We have done lots of studies on this, especially for rice. It has been reported in recent studies that we will lose up to 40% of the rice that we have now by 2100, by uh, 2100, if the temperature continue to increase as it's increasing. And this is very bad for us. If you remember from my earlier slides, 50% of the earth population depends on arsenic. So that depends on rice. So the majority of their caloric intake comes from rice. So we already have food insecurity and increasing temperature will again add more stress to this food security problem. Another reason why global warming will affect uh, um, rice quality is because the hotter it gets, studies have shown a positive correlation with increasing in temperature and increasing in arsenic content in the rice grain. And we know already that arsenic is toxic. And if we eat it, we will suffer from various forms of cancer and organ damage. And in addition to being toxic to us, if the methylated forms of arsenic are in high concentration in the soil, it will also lead to crop loss. If you look at the figure to the right, you would see I have uh, some pinnacles that are high, that is circle in red. This is showing a rice plant that is suffering from a disease known as straight head disease. So straight head disease is no different from what we observe in our canap. So you have a canap tree, it blooms and bear all of the flower, you expecting to have canap by the end of the summer. But then those flowers disappear and no canaps appear. The same thing happened to the rice. The rice carry out its life cycle, the pinnacles appear, the greens appear, but the greens are never filled. So there's no rice. So this is straight head disease. So this poses both a major health risk as well as a food security, because if the rice is available, you eat the rice, you become uh, um, in contact with the arsenic and that will kill you. And if the arsenic concentration, especially methylated arsenic concentration is high in the soil, that will significantly reduce your um, rice yield. And that will significantly increase the pressure we already face with food insecurity. But the problem we have now is that we 
the understand it, but the mechanism of how increasing temperature affect the behavior of arsenic, making arsenic bioavailable for the plant is not widely known. It is poorly studied. But we know from previous research that the soil microbes will play a very important role on the behavior of anything that's in the soil. We know from previous research that the soil microbe behavior will be significantly affected by increasing temperature. So as temperatures increase, the soil microbial activities will significantly increase. And if air is not present, they need to breed these metals. And if they are breeding these metals, we're going to have much more reduction of mineral oxide. And more mineral re oxide reduction correlates highly with arsenic release into the soil pore water, which means more arsenic will become available for the plant and the plant will uptake more arsenic. And we know that this arsenic can do one, reduce crop yield and two, significantly impair crop quality because arsenic is toxic for us. So, so how are the microbes able to affect arsenic behavior? These microbes are able to affect arsenic behavior because they have the ability to transform arsenic from one species to another. Remember in the earlier slides, I talked about organic arsenic and inorganic arsenic and the different types of organic arsenic and the different types of um, inorganic arsenic. So the microbes in the soil have the ability to transform these arsenic from one form to another. And they are able to do this because they contain special genes. And these genes can either one, reduce the, uh, um, the arsenic five to arsenic three. And two genes that are in microbes that can carry out this is the ARSC gene and the AAR gene. These, A these two genes will convert the less toxic arsenic five into arsenic three. And of course, this is never good because this would mean arsenic-3 concentration in the soil pore water will increase and then plants will be able to accumulate more of this arsenic-3. We have another gene, the AIO gene. The AIO gene will produce oxidase enzymes. So what these oxidase enzymes do, they will convert arsenic-3 back to arsenic-5. And this is kind of good because arsenic-5 is more likely to precipitate with iron oxide and therefore arsenic-5 concentration will decrease in the soil pore water. And then we have a third gene, which is the ARSM gene. This ARSM gene produces methylase, which is an enzyme that will methylate arsenic-3 into organic forms of arsenic. And in the past, we, said, we thought this was really good, but in fact, this is a very evil trans transformation. The bacteria is methylating ARS, is methylating arsenic-3 into methylated arsenic species because arsenic-3 is also toxic to the bacteria. However, the methylated forms of arsenic will accumulate in the soil pore water and if the plant uptake those ones in large quantities, it will force the rice plant to develop straight head disease. And we know that straight head disease will significantly reduce rice yield and rice quality. So what was the goal of this study? Why we chose to conduct this study? So we chose to conduct this study because the mechanism behind this is very poor, it's poorly understood. We wanted to understand we wanted to explain how elevated temperatures will affect arsenic biotransformation. And we say arsenic biotransformation because we are only focusing on the transformation of arsenic that comes or that is catalyzed by microbes in the soil. We also wanted to understand how increasing temperatures will increase arsenic translocation from the soil to the green. We know that the arsenic in the soil, but we're not too concerned about that. We're concerned about the arsenic in the green. We wanted to study how increasing temperature will take this arsenic 
from the soil into the root, into the sim, into the grain, and then to our tables. And lastly, we wanted to understand how increasing temperatures will affect the microbial community and arsenic transformation genes in the soil. Because the more of certain genes in the soil, the more of certain types of microbes we have in the soil, the higher the likelihood of arsenic reduction and arsenic release would be. So the more uh, um, these plants will have arsenic available for them. So to study this, we constructed a very simple experiment. We took soil from a known arsenic contaminated paddy soil. So the same exact soil was used for the same exact treatments. We used two treatments. We used a treatment where we incubate and grow the plant in the greenhouse at 28 degrees Celsius. And the second treatment, we take the same plant, we take the plant with using the same soil and we grow them at 33 degrees Celsius, which is five degrees higher than the temperature we have today and which is in line with the predicted temperature we expect to have by the year 2100. And over time, we monitor one, the soil pour water. So the soil pour water is the water that is available in this between soil particles. And it's the water that is around the plant root. And it's the water where these metals are dissolving. So that's where those metals are going to move into the uh, um, rice root and into the rice plant itself. And at the end of the experiment, we weigh and measure the height of the plant. And we also analyze and quantify the arsenic transformation gene and the bacterial community. So what did we, what did our results tell us? Our result told us that one, if we can, if the earth temperature continue to increase, this will significantly negatively impact plant weight. As you can see from this data here, the height is not significantly impacted. They are roughly the same, but the plant weight is significantly impacted. The plant weight decreased by up to 48% when we grew that plant at 38 degrees Celsius. And this is not good news. This is not good news at all because this means the yield the amount of rice we'll have available to feed this ever increasing population is significantly reduced. We also found that increasing temperature significantly affected the arsenic that is available for the plant to uptake. We see that when we increase the temperature by five degrees, the total arsenic, which include both the organic and the inorganic arsenic in the soil concentration significantly increase. This means that more poison is available in the soil for the plant to uptake and for the plant to store in their greens. When we look at this one step further, we see in the soil pore water that the more toxic form of arsenic, which is arsenic three, concentration increase by 139% at 33 degrees Celsius as compared to when this plant was grown at 28 degrees Celsius. This is extremely bad news because the plant can uptake arsenic three, uh, because the rice plant can uptake arsenic three and arsenic three is known to be very toxic to us in terms of causing cancer and various organ failure and will also significantly affect the soil microbial community and destroy the soil health. So we know that more arsenic is being released in the soil, which means that this arsenic is available for the plant to uptake. But we need to make sure, or we wanted to make sure that, we wanted to make sure and we wanted to study if the plant was actually uptaking this uh, uh, arsenic and how increasing temperature affected the translocation or the movement of this arsenic into the right pl rice plant tissue. 
So our results show that in the roots, the, at higher uh, um, temperature, we have more accumulation of arsenic. And in the shoot, we do not have a very, we have more accumulation of arsenic at 33 degrees Celsius, but the difference is not significant. And in the green, we have more accumulation of arsenic at 33 degrees Celsius, and the difference is significant. So this means that when we increase temperature, the rate and the amount of arsenic that moves from the soil into the grains and make to our table significantly increases. And you might ask, why is it that the concentration of arsenic in the roots is so much higher than the concentration of arsenic in the shoots and in the grain? Well, just like us, the plant does not want to die. When the plant is stressed, especially rice plant, it's going to leak oxygen from the root tip and that is going to stimulate the formation of iron plaque. And once iron plaque is formed around the root, it's going to trap, remember I said earlier that arsenic-5 is very likely to trap on the surface of iron oxide or other mineral oxide. It's going to trap many of this arsenic-5 and impede its movement up into the plant and up into the grain. So this is not good because we have an enhanced translocation of total arsenic from the soil into uh, the rice grain and later to our table. So we wanted to look at this in more detail. We know that, and if you are familiar with arsenic, you know that when the standards are being made, very little attention is paid on total arsenic because we believe that organic arsenic is not toxic to us, so there's no reason to take that into account. So we wanted to look at arsenic species. And when we look at the arsenic species, we see that in every case, increasing temperature will increase the concentration of arsenic-3 in the plant, except for in the shoot. And more specifically, increasing temperature significantly enhanced by up to 105% more arsenic in the greens. And it's the greens, uh, more arsenic um, three into the greens. And it's the greens that we're gonna eat. And this is also very bad news for us because increasing temperature will increase and enhance inorganic arsenic translocation from the soil into the greens and eventually into our pots. So why is this happening? What's causing it? We know from previous work that the soil microbes plays a very important role. And we want to confirm that is indeed the soil microbe that is causing the increase in inorganic arsenic into the plant. So we first measure the AIO gene. If you remember, AIO gene was a gene that's going to convert the toxic arsenic-3 into the less toxic arsenic-5, and which is more likely to, pr to precipitate on iron oxide and not be available for the plant. We see that when we increase the temperature, the bacteria that bears this gene population significantly decreased at 33 degrees. And that's not good news because this means you will have more arsenic tree available in the soil pore water for the plant to uptake. So, we look at the arsenic reducing gene. So this is the gene that's going to reduce the less toxic arsenic-5 into arsenic-3 and make arsenic-3 available for plants. We see that increase in temperature significantly upregulated simply means significantly increase the bacteria in the soil that contains this gene. So you have more bacteria that has the ability to transform arsenic-5 into arsenic-3. And again, this is terrible news because you're gonna have more arsenic-3 available in the soil pore water and more arsenic-3 for the rice to uptake and that increases your likelihood of getting arsenic into your table. And when we look at the arsenic methylating gene, we see that there's no big difference between the bacteria in the soil 
that is able to do this at 33 degrees Celsius and those in the soil at 28 degrees Celsius. And again, this is not really good nor bad news. It can be very misleading. This simply means that the bacteria that we have in our sample just prefer to reduce arsenic and they are able to tolerate this arsenic because methylating arsenic is a detoxification process for bacteria. I know I have said a lot and it's a mouthful. It's a whole class in biology and a whole class in chemistry at the same time, but I'm going to leave you with some very important take home message. The first take home message is one, increasing temperatures will enhance arsenic reducing bacteria abundance in the soil. And this is not good because more arsenic-5 will be reduced to arsenic-3 and more arsenic-3 will be available for the plant. Increasing temperatures will enhance the relative abundance of bacteria that bears the genes to, that, I, that produces the enzyme that is required to catalyze arsenic-5 reduction. It also, this in turn will also result in an increase in dissolved arsenic concentration in the soil pore water. And if arsenic concentration is enhanced in the soil pore water, it's available. So the plant will definitely uptake it by mis because the plant uptake arsenic by mistake, thinking it's silicone or um, phosphate that it actually needs for growth. And, it and that plant is not stupid. It's gonna translocate that arsenic into its grain so it doesn't die. And then when we eat that arsenic grain, we'll come in contact with that arsenic. So the whole you know, take home message here, global warming is going to have detrimental effect on the soil microbes and it's going to cause increased release of arsenic in the soil pore water. And the plants are going to uptake this arsenic and it's going to reduce both crop quality because you, if you're eating something that's giving you cancer, it's definitely not good quality. And it's also going to reduce crop yield. So the most important message from my slide is to stop treating the soil like dirt, because what you put in the soil will get back from the soil and end up on your table and it will definitely punish you, even to the point where it kills you. I would like to acknowledge um, Professor Tong for accepting me as a sidelight member in his lab. I would also like to acknowledge my collaborators at Georgian University that sponsors my research. I would love to thank Dr. Sims, Tanya Sims and Dr. Stubbs for going over my slide and definitely reducing the chemistry, reducing the biology and making it very palatable and very easy to explain. And this research was funded by the National uh, um, Natural Science Foundation of China and the Clean Development Mechanism Fund grant. And thank you for listening to my presentation. If you have any questions, any concerns, I will try my best to address them to the best of my ability. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gustave. It was really uh, an eye opener for all of us, an interesting presentation. I think you would have scared all of us now in, in <laughs> consuming rice. <laughs> uh, so I have a few questions here. Uh, firstly, can you buy arsenic free rice? Well, Where and what should a consumer look for on packaging? Well, okay. So there's no such thing as arsenic free rice. Rice is a hyper accumulator of arsenic, but rice from different region of the world will be contaminated with different species of arsenic. So if you buy arse, a rice that was produced in the US and as opposed to buying rice that was produced in Asia, it might be safer to eat rice from the US because rice from the US is known to be contaminated with the organic forms of arsenic, which our body can deal with. And rice from Asia is known to be contaminated with the more toxic form of inorganic form of arsenic. And I say safer in quotation mark because your gut microbiome, the bacteria in your gut can demethylate arsenic, simply means it convert that organic arsenic back into its inorganic species and cause problem with you. So the best thing to do, read your rice label and consume one serving as rice as the WHO recommend. It's a reason why they recommend such little amount of rice per serving. Yep, indeed. <laughs> um, 
how are Bahamians contributing to the contamination of the soil? That's a very important question, in fact, and it's a, it's a very important question, and all of us have seen it and we're not saying anything. One, we contribute to soil contaminating when we dump our stuff inappropriately. And secondly, we have poor regulations on especially the scrap metal industry. If you draw, drive on Glaston Road, you'll see this huge scrap metal company in the middle of an urban area, and they're just receiving scrap metals and getting rid of the plastic parts, and they just have it in the soil, and no one is saying anything about it. So you can imagine what the groundwater quality is looking like there. So we need more policies that prevent us from dumping stuff into the ground, and we also need to be more vigilant when we see such companies popping up in very urbanized areas without having proper lining and in, uh, in, in their facilities to prevent leaching of these metals. Your studies, uh, you, you, you use two temperature, 28 degrees and 33 degrees. So there's a question now here from, uh, from uh, Tanya Sims. Uh, would the effect be reversed if temperatures are lowered below 28? Yes, totally will be reversed because what ha and this is an awesome question. What happens to bacteria? The more the higher the temperature is, the more active they get, the more babies they make, and the more food they eat. And when temperatures get cold, they are less active. And if they are less active, then they will reduce the metals less, and this will significantly decrease the release and the bioavailability of these metals in the soil. Excellent. So if you, is, do you think that if paddy uh, rice is grown in a, in a greenhouse with a controlled temperature, that may be the way forward for healthy rice production? No. no? I, and the reason for that is when you grow rice in greenhouse and in controlled temperature, you also increase the transpiration rate. So the movement of water from the frown up the rice. And that also come up with a lot of inorganic arsenic. So I've seen... Um, you can amend the soil by increasing, by adding um, um, substances that will increase the soil mineral and trap more arsenic. Or we know, you know, we know the rice cycle. We know the biogeochemistry. We can find points in the rice cycle, especially to the grain, during the grain filling stage and, and dry out the rice paddy and all of the arsenic will become immobilized and not available during the uh, um, grain filling stage. So you will have less arsenic accumulating in the grain. But there's a problem with that. When rice experience these conditions, the yield also decrease, even though it produce better quality rice, but the amount is decreased and we need to produce large quantities of rice. So whatever cooking process that you do will not change the, 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 the arsenic content in the rice no, it will definitely, you know, different cooking methods definitely affect the arsenic concentration in the rice. So if you soak your rice overnight, you will leach lots of the arsenic out of the rice. But there's also a problem with that. You will leach all of the other trace elements that you need for growth from the rice. Oh, okay. All right, then. Thank you so much. This, this was really an interesting presentation and uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, insight from both the presenters today. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gustave and Dr. Lam for really uh, an excellent presentation. Uh, as I've said at the beginning, uh, we will share your presentation uh, and also the, uh, the recording of the session today. So if you have further question or question that, that was not answered, please feel free to communicate uh, with both the researchers or you can even write uh, to me or write to the research center, the research at ub.edu.bs, and we will send the questions uh, to everyone. So thank you once again to all the uh, partic uh, all the participants who are coming in, and also all those who have uh, listened to us uh, from uh, 2 p.m. today. I know we have extended the time today by almost 15 minutes, so sorry about that, but I hope you have enjoyed the session today. So I'm looking forward uh, for you to join us again for the month of uh, April's uh, Research Edge session, which will be held on the 9th of April. Uh, look out for the flyer that will be coming out very soon. So until I see you again, have a good weekend and have a safe weekend. Thank you again. Bye-bye.